uh, there, are probably, there are probably other inflammatory molecules which have similar uh, roles or similar functions. And I believe that there is uh, lots of things to, to, to do. Hmm. I mean, drug, drug companies are very interested in neuroinflammation currently, no? Drug companies are, yeah, that's, that's good. And it's, 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 a, it's a threat at the same time, you know? <clears throat> um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you have seen our, uh, our neuron paper at the beginning of the year where we uh, yes. had data from Delcode and found that there is an initial even protective immune reaction, which is, um, you know, characterized by an enhanced uh, TAM receptor shedding, which mm -hmm. is associated with preservation of um, cortical tissue in the subsequent years and preservation of, um, of uh, um, cognition. So the interesting thing is that like decades before the clinical onset, you know, there might be even a protective part. And I'm just thinking that we miss a lot of longitudinal information yet still in, in order to really precisely um, identify the uh, time points and, and you know, the uh, of opportunity treatment targets and, and time points to do so. So Dr. Henneke, can we get started? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, hello uh, and, and welcome to the seminar presentation by Dr. Michael Thomas Henneke from the University of uh, Bonn Medical Center, but now in the University of Luxembourg. Um, Dr. Henneke is a board certified neurologist and a clinician scientist with over 25 years of experience in studying neurodegenerative diseases at experimental, preclinical, and clinical levels. He has a long-standing interest in immunology and neuroscience, while the main focus of his work is related to dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease. He has also been working on ALS and Parkinson's disease. At the clinical level, he has established a neurodegenerative outpatient unit at the University of Münster and the University of Bonn in Germany. From 2016 to 2021, he led the Department of Neurodegenerative Disease and uh, psychiatry in Bonn. From Jan 2022 uh, onwards, he is the director of the Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine at the University of Luxembourg and principal investigator in the Neuroinflammation Group. He has received many honors and awards. These include the Hans und Ilse Brewer Alzheimer's Research Award, uh, the Krista Lawrence ALS Research Prize. He's also the uh, Clarivate uh, Highly Cited Researcher uh, from, I think, 2019 to 2021. Uh, Dr. Hanaka, thank you very much for joining us. And please go ahead and get started. Well, Rams, thanks for this very kind introduction. And thanks for having me, giving me the opportunity to discuss whether um, inflammation drives protein aggregation in neurodegenerative disease um, or not um, <clears throat> on this occasion. Um, and uh, I will do this on the example of uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease and give you two examples uh, arising from our work over the past years, which um, suggests that this is uh, indeed the case. So in Alzheimer's disease, we believe that some initiating uh, factor is the sequential cleavage of the amyloid uh, precursor protein by beta and gamma secretase yielding amyloid beta monomers of which the best known of are the 1 to 40 and 1 to 42 in amino acid length, which should usually leave our brain either by export via the CSF or the glial lymphatic pathway. And the remaining 50% is then locally degraded by microglia cells and other cells, uh, for example, by secretion of, of IDE or phagocytic clearance. If this system gets out of balance, there is uh, oligomer formation and, and ABDA fibro formation, which initially can be uh, visualized by uh, blood systems and then by uh, visualizing the uh, amyloid beta deposits uh, in the parenchyma of the brain. And this deposition actually uh, starts an inflammatory reaction, which is characterized by microglia activation, which you see on the left side and an astroglial uh, reaction surrounding these deposits uh, on the right side. And ultimately and importantly, um, this disease is characterized by a formation of 
neurofibrillary tangles within neurons, which initially may indicate the dysfunction and later on the death of uh, these neurons. Now, um, this is a cortical section of an AD patient, uh, sh which is showing you uh, Congo rat uh, immune staining and uh, MHC class two positive microglia cells. And long before Congo rat has been used as a stain for human brain, it has been actually developed for, uh, as something completely different. It has been developed um, as a stain for uh, shirts um, by um, Paul Böttcher in uh, Leverkusen in 8070. And uh, because the Rhineland is such a rainy region, turns out that it would not stay in their shirts and would be washed out. So they put uh, it back on a shelf until a clinic person by accident would throw that vial to the ground, leaving the laboratory ground in a very strained fashioned way. And this uh, was the initial observation that, uh, that led to the discovery that Congo rat would be a fantastic bacterial stain. And um, so the question now, what is the um, commonality of a bacterial surface and an AD brain? What it does, what it does stain here is beta sheet structured amyloids. And it does exactly the same on the surface of bacteria because uh, as work from Matthew Chapman and colleagues 2002 published in Science uh, showed, the, uh, several bacteria very common to us, including Escherichia coli, uh, Staph aureus, uh, Salmonella tuffimurium, carry beta sheet structured amyloids on their surface by nature. And they look pretty much uh, uh, the same as the ones which deposit in our brain. Now, in other uh, uh, words, this means that an innate immune cell, uh, like a microglia cell, has been taught by nature over a million of years of evolution and equipped with so-called pattern recognition receptors. And these pattern recognition receptors are various families. The most prominent family is the toll-like receptor family, the scavenger receptors, CD36 and CD47, but others as well. And those um, <clears throat> A-beta sheet structured amyloids, uh, including the amyloid beta in the brains of Alzheimer patients, but also alpha synuclein and even tau ligate uh, tau-like receptors and initiate an immune reaction, which uh, leads uh, to uh, inflammatory signal transduction and the generation of immune factors and a phagocytic clearance response. Now, if microglia cells undergo activation, um, in this example here at a plaque deposit, you see that they undergo mo uh, massive morphological change. They retract their processes, which uh, otherwise uh, span over the immediate environment and scan this constantly. Um, this process retraction um, is also um, characterizing the stage of the cell, which um, uh, leads to the release of complement factors, uh, cytokines, hemokines, nitric oxide and radical oxygen species. At the same time, these cells stop doing a lot of sensible things for our brain, uh, including the reduction of synaptic scaling, uh, redu reduced production of neurotrophic factors, including BDNF, and they are less efficient in clearing debris from the brain. Now, this inflammatory reaction can be visualized in human brain of living patients and non-demented controls, as shown in this example given to me by David Brooks. Um, and it's using a PET ligand, PK11195, which labels uh, microglia um, uh, um, mostly, to a lesser extent, also activated uh, astrocytes, but <clears throat> you can uh, nicely see that there is enhancement in the limbic structures and neocortex, while the 10 year older non demented uh, control actually shows only vascular enhancement. Now, it's important to know that if you study um, uh, inflammatory signal transduction pathways, um, that you make sure that these are conserved between species. And because lots of our information and, uh, arises from mouse experimentation, and uh, with respect to the innate immune system, there's uh, roughly 40% of the pathways being conserved and even less 30% on the adaptive uh, immune side. So 
therefore, we we were really uh, uh, very much focusing on data coming here from Eric Bodeke's group uh, in Groningen and published in this elegant Nature Neuroscience paper in 2017, where Eric took four different data sets from various labs and compared them uh, together, identifying a, a core signature of human microglia cells. And in this core uh, signature, you find the uh, so-called inflammasomes and their respective products into leukine one beta and IL-18. And the most abundant inflammasome now in, uh, in the human brain, and especially in microglia cells, is the NAL3 inflammasome, which is regulated in a two-step fashion by a transcriptional activation step that requires ligation of a toll-like receptor or a cytokine receptor, initiating the transcription uh, of uh, cytokine and chemokine proforms, and also of an auto-inhibited NALP3. And then in a second step, which is the post-transcriptional activation step, there is various steps of licensing the assembly of the active NALP3 inflammasome and it's maturing to an S spec, which then has the outward directed test-based activity cleaving proforms of IL-18, IL-1-beta, and gastermin D. The gastermin D cleavage product is uh, transported to the membrane and forms a pore that uh, orchestras and directs the release of the active uh, cytokines. Now, we looked at this system um, in Alzheimer disease uh, patient brains, and this is showing you an ASC spec. Uh, in green here, residing in a microglia cell that is activated in the frontal cortex section of an AD case. And actually to, to get an idea about the activation uh, of this system in, in AD uh, brain samples, we started to blot for its activity uh, by uh, analyzing the relation of proforms of caspase one to the cleaved caspase one protein, and if you compare this in H-matched uh, non-demented controls in 80 cases, you see a massive upregulation. Um, and luckily, this was mimicked by various mouse models, in this case, uh, by the animal model generated by John Jankowski and David Borchild, APPPS1 transgenic uh, mice. And you can see that in an H-dependent way, around eight months, we see uh, caspase cleavage uh, increasing and uh, persists until later uh, ages. If we knock it down in uh, the um, uh, APPPS1 mouse model by crossing in, not knockout animals, we completely block this uh, signal and we also lower um, amyloid uh, 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 or a beta uh, deposition induced L1 beta generation in those brains. Now, after Looking in this work to the entire uh, role of the, uh, <clears throat> the NAMP inflammasome, we later went on to uh, think about the fate of these uh, immune cells, which uh, have this persisting and chronic exposure to these beta sheet structured amyloids. And we found that they would undergo a pyroptotic cell death, uh, a cell death through inflammation, if you wish. And through this, they would release a so-called S-spec. And here you see that uh, you can find S-specs in the extracellular space in the AD patient brain, but also in uh, the mouse model. And we quantified and characterized this. And then later, we went on to uh, find ways to stimulate this in vitro. And there's a protocol using bacterial lipopolysaccharide or ATP, followed by NetGeris in the classic inflammasome inducer which uh, we exposed primary microglia cells to and analyzed the outcome of um, uh, ASC spec pro uh, production and release um, by microscopy of fact sorting. You can see there's one example. You can see that we really identified the freed ASC spec in this cell culture experiment. And then I set out to prove that actually amyloid beta would be a fantastic inducer of microglial pyroptosis and I tortured a number of students and postdocs, and well, they all failed. Um, so I had to, myself to use uh, the only amyloid beta which was left, which was Tamra labeled. And, and I was very lucky with that because looking in the microscope, I failed as well. So I took a look in the microscope and found that immediately after the amyloid beta would um, uh, um, be exposed to a released ASCS back, 
uh, that uh, amyloid beta would bind to it. And you just saw this in this little video and you can see the uh, green aspects and the red hollow of the uh, amyloid beta surrounding it. Um, so <clears throat> we then uh, also did uh, electron microscopy and uh, uh, you see here that uh, a beta alone or S uh, uh, alone um, and then the co-incubation experiment, what you see is that um, <clears throat> the S spec works like a, a magnet to the amyloid beta peptide. So we suppose that once microglia would die by paraptosis and release an S spec, there would be oligomerization and maybe uh, uh, the S specs would be an ideal matrix for further amyloid deposition. And to prove this, actually, we started um, uh, to use the tioflavin T uh, assay, and you see here in green the uh, aggregation time. So this is showing you the um, uh, uh, conversion of a monomer to an aggregate in green in the absence of um, S specs, and then you see increasing concentrations of uh, of S specs, and I hope you can see that there is a strong shift to the left. We then proved this also by uh, Western blotting experiments. You see, can see that in the absence of any S concentration, there's hardly fibro or oligomer formation. And in this case, when we co-incubated S specs with amyloid beta 1 to 40, but uh, increasing those concentrations would show us uh, A beta and oligomer formation. And this was the same by using amyloid beta 1 to 42. I'm sorry. This is too fast and this goes automatically now. Um, let's go one. So this is the very same thing here. And you can see that the absence of S specs, there's hardly fibro and oligomer formation. And would like you to keep this in mind because we will see later a very similar phenomenon in the in vivo experiment. Now, we then went on and together with Jochen Walter um, and Satish Kuma, we performed this uh, co-sedimentation uh, assay. Um, and here, what uh, Satish and, and Jochen did, they compared amyloid beta 1 to 40 either alone, together with aspects or ask alone. You can see that um, at time point zero, everything is in the supernatant, nothing in the pellet, while six hours later, uh, the picture is totally different. Most of the uh, uh, the ask and ABD has been gone from the supernatant and, and, and can be found back in the pellet. So it's like an artificial amyloid beta deposit and the aspect has drawn all the amyloid beta uh, into a pellet like structure. So that um, stimulated experiments where we looked at to uh, mouse brains and we found amyloid beta bound to um, ask um, by co precipitation experiments in an age-dependent fashion. So this turned out to be present in eight-month-old animals and later at 12 months. And when we did immunostaining of the plaques, we actually could show that ASK would be located in the core of the amyloid beta deposit, while the 6E10 positive amyloid beta would form a hollow around it, uh, very similar to the little in vitro cell culture experiment I just showed you the video of. Now, uh, we then went on to do this in uh, an, an animal uh, um, spreading and seeding model, which has been uh, developed and introduced by Larry Walker and Matthias Jucker. And basically, we injected uh, a brain, uh, uh, wild-type brain control versus APP plus one brain lysate in opposing hypocampi and analyzed those after five months for the spread of pathology. We looked for amyloid beta plaque number and area, and also for biochemistry. And this is one of the important experiments here in this um, analysis here. You see that uh, when we compared wild-type lysate receiving uh, brain hemispheres to a brain, the hemisphere that had received the APPBS1 lysate, there's a twofold increase in total area and number of A beta plaques. Um, and in the APPPS1 mouse brain, if you look to the lysate, to the brain analysis, there's no effect on APP processing, but there's a strong increase in oligomers and fibrils. There's also a strong increase in total A beta. And this experiment basically verifies previous data by Matthias Jukas' lab published in Science uh, with my, uh, Melanie Meyer Lehmann in 2008. Now, looking at um, now and um, 
uh, non-injected mouse brain showed that that would hardly affect the system. Again, there is no increase in total area or number of amyloid beta deposits, and there is a very similar pattern of um, oligomers and fibrils uh, like in the hemisphere that received the wild type uh, lysate. And now we do the very same experiment in mice, which are APP PS1 transgenic, but ask knockout. So they cannot form and release as specs. And when we do so, we see that, oops, sorry, that's too fast. We see that we have here this whole area of um, uh, basically absent a, uh, a fibril and, and oligomer formation. So, and likewise, we find a, a strong drop in, in total area and, and number of amyloid beta deposits. So there is no increase in, in these animals as in the animals which have an intact uh, inflammasome and ASK system. And these experiments told us that um, ASK is in this animal model mandatory for the spreading of ABDA pathology in response to uh, such a lysate injection. Now, <clears throat> we wanted to take this a little further and develop another mouse model. Uh, where we use a two photon laser scanning in vivo unit. Uh, you can see that we, uh, we analyze uh, awake mice which walk a treadmill under this two photon laser scanning microscope. These animals are APPPS1 transgenic and they have an ASK uh, and cherry knock in. Um, and on top, they express uh, EGFP under a microglia uh, driver, 63CO1. So we have green microglia. We have red as specs, and we have an APP PS1 uh, background. These animals receive metoxy XO4 to label amyloid beta. And what you now see is microglia pyroptosis, the release of as specs. And then when we inject amyloid beta, you see that the amyloid beta uh, labeled by metoxy XO4 forms a hollow surrounding these as specs. And this is an Nothing less than showing you ongoing amyloid beta deposition initiated by ASK spec release uh, through pyroptotic microglia in the living mouse brain. Now, what about humans? Um, as a neurologist, I'm uh, more interested in what happens in our uh, uh, own brains. And so we looked at tissue from AD and control cases again, and we found the same amyloid beta. Uh, as binding by co-immunoprecipitation, uh, but more, more interestingly, we then went on to uh, split the fluffy fiber compartment of the plaque from its core uh, by sucrose gradient centrifugation uh, of three different patient populations of controls, which are no patients, but MCI and AD cases. And what we found was that in the uh, core, we already see in MCI cases ASK and A beta co localized. While the only difference uh, of the AD cases was that we would see actually um, more amyloid beta in the fluffy fiber compartment. And when we then went to histology, we found that again, our core of the plaque was uh, ASK made material here in red. And the 6010 green amyloid beta would surround it like a, uh, like a hollow. So this very much mimics what we have found in the animal model before and what we saw in the in vitro cell culture experiment in, uh, where we induced the release of aspects in the presence of Tamara red labeled amyloid beta. Unfortunately, that's not an, uh, an entirely new phenomenon and found by my lab. Here you see a microglia section, which I call uh, microglia Armageddon. You see released as specs in red or some uh, dying microglia. There is no healthy microglia cell in this section, but the very same microglia suffering has been uh, uh, already depicted by Alois Alzheimer and Franz Nisle in an elegant publication in 1911. And if you see the local, the lowest panel of microglia cells, I, you can find back all these corpses in the immuno section, uh, which is next to it. Now, the second example um, actually is here. Um, again, the uh, the. Uh, uh, microglia human core signature and showing you that there are various cytokines in this core signature, 
which indu uh, induces a system uh, which is enzymatically producing nitric oxide, which is the uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase or nitric oxide synthase type 2. And all these inducers of nitric oxide synthase type 2 are present in, in microglia cells are inducing the system and <clears throat> inflammation induced NOS or uh, 2 or INOS has been described in AD long ago in microglia cells as well as in astroglial cells. Uh, NOS 2 converts L arginine to L citrulline um, and forms uh, nitric oxide, which then can react with molecular oxygen to peroxynitride. And peroxynitride is one of the stronger modification modif modifiers of um, <clears throat> cysteine and tyrosine residues, which can either nitrosylate or, or nitrate uh, those residues. Now, we um, cross NOS knockout animals um, into APPPS1 transgenic mice. And we also treated APPPS1 transgenic mice with an INOS selective inhibitor. And uh, looking at um, uh, working memory uh, and reference memory performance after a six and 12 months, we found that in both cases, um, um, the knockout as well as the pharmacological inhibitor would protect uh, from most of the, uh, uh, these um, memory deficits which had been described uh, in this model before. Now, <clears throat> we then had to come up with a reason for this uh, behavioral improvement. And uh, when we did so, we, um, we analyzed the APP uh, processing pathway without finding uh, differences in APP or C-terminal fragments, um, no differences in IDE, neprolysin as major degrading pathways. But in the SDS fraction, we showed uh, uh, by ELISA and by immunoblotting a strong decrease, about 50% reduction of amyloid beta deposition. Um, and this was also mimicked by a histological analysis where we found much less and much smaller amyloid beta deposits in APPPS1 NOS2 knockout animals as compared to APPPS1 mice. So we had to come up with an explanation to that. And, you know, without having differences in phagocytosis, which we excluded without having differences in processing, it became um, uh, really um, uh, more difficult with every day we thought about it to come up with a, a really a reasonable uh, a reason for that reduction uh, by just knocking out this uh, system. Now, Turns out that we found the same thing when we uh, treated animals with the pharmacological inhibitor. So it could not be the regulation of any other gene or could not inter be any, any weird uh, 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 knockout uh, effect here. Um, and then we looked at the uh, sequence of amyloid beta and compared the human to the mouse and the rat. We all know that the mouse and the rat do not deposit amyloid beta on their own. And there are three differences. And one of the differences here was really striking to us um, because the human sequence has a tyrosine at position 10 and the mouse does not. So we compared this and looked whether this tyrosine position 10 would actually be modifiable by peroxynitride. And you can see here by this um, mass spec analysis that uh, we had a, a nice a nitration of profile um, in the case when the tyrosine was present in the sequence. But when we ex exchanged it to an alanin, this was completely uh, gone. And uh, below, you just see the comparison. So it was clear that, in principle, the tyrosine could be nitrated by inos-derived nitric oxide. <laughs> so we next looked by the uh, uh, already introduced uh, um, T fluorescence assay to uh, effects on the propensity of amyloid beta to aggregate. And you see here the aggregation, uh, aggregation curve in, in black quarters, uh, amyloid beta alone over five hours. And then you see when we uh, expose amyloid beta to peroxynitride, there is a dramatic increase 
Well, if we exchange the al uh, tyrosine to a phenylalanine and we expose it to peroxynitride, uh, you can see that we even re uh, uh, remain below the uh, endogenous uh, aggregation uh, curve, despite the presence of peroxynitride. Now, this was mimicked in a, in a, a blood analysis. You again can see here the um, aggregation over time of amyloid beta 42, then in, uh, stronger in response to co incubation with peroxynitride, and then the uh, Y2F uh, uh, mutant, uh, which did not react to peroxynitride and was even below the uh, auto aggregation of amyloid beta. Now, <clears throat> We then had to, uh, the problem that we could not detect that uh, um, uh, tyrosine nitration easily. So we developed our own antibodies by immunizing uh, a rabbit and uh, we're very lucky because all the uh, uh, nitrating uh, uh, residues are highly immunogen, so immunogenic. So they, we got great antibodies. <clears throat> you can see here when we characterize those, we uh, had really uh, no signal in uh, the Y2F uh, control while amyloid beta was easily uh, positive and all, under all condition, 6010 became positive. So we had a, a highly selective uh, anti-nitration, uh, anti-abeta antibody for the nitration at position 10. And we used this uh, actually to stain um, APPPS1 mouse brain and AD brain. And again, we found that there is a difference between the outer part of uh, the plaque, uh, which became IC16 positive, and the core. And it looked like in both cases, for uh, in the APPPS1 mouse brain as in the AD brain, most of the core material would be nitrated amyloid beta. And so we went on to prove this by uh, the centrifugation experiments uh, against 6010. You see 6010 versus our 3 and T tyrosine 10 antibody in, in wild type mice and APP PS1 mice. So there's easy to see that there is more in the, fra in the fraction five and six, which are the uh, course of the plaque. <clears throat> and that also holds true for uh, uh, the analysis of human patient brain if you compare it to non-demented uh, H-match controls. Now, <clears throat> we looked at really early deposition and interestingly, the, uh, as you can see here, uh, a large uh, surface of the initial uh, plaque deposit showed uh, a nitration uh, signal already at five months uh, of, uh, of age. So very early when the position in this mouse model just starts. At 12 months, the uh, relation became a little different and we had more IC16 uh, material in comparison to uh, the nitrated amyloid beta. And when we quantified this, uh, comparing the amyloid beta versus the nitrated amyloid beta surface, we found that we see uh, an, uh, a stronger in, uh, relation uh, or a, a, a predominant role for nitration in the early age, while the later then maybe just be aggregating around this initial seed. So, <clears throat> A number uh, uh, of questions arose from this, and one was whether um, nitrated amyloid beta would uh, form de novo deposits and seed again. So we isolated those and we injected them in uh, the cortex and in the hippocampus, and indeed could uh, seed amyloid beta in uh, APP PS1 transgenic um, mouse brain, as shown here. And um, we have now experiments which I could not include in this presentation for time reasons, where we even show that we might see uh, uh, deposition in, in wild type animals. Now, <clears throat> these are the magnifications showing you that there's really 100% colocalization of the amyloid beta and the nitri uh, nitrated amyloid beta, and there is fresh non-nitrated amyloid beta, which uh, is not injected, which surrounds the initial seed. So 
what we su uh, suggest is that nitration by in an ethnos 2 uh, immune mediated uh, fashion changes the amyloid beta uh, monomer and uh, leads to oligomer formation and then to mixed seed which uh, gives the uh, rise to the plaque appearance which uh, we detected in APPPS1 mouse brain and in in uh, in AD patient brain. Is there therapeutic potential? Uh, maybe there is because this um, paper here um, uh, using a, an, uh, the very same inhibitor which we used in the animal experiment, L-nil, uh, tested um, to be completely uh, uh, without side effects um, in uh, humans from 200 to, to from 20 to 200 milligram uh, dosage. Uh, this uh, substance uh, crosses the blood brain barrier fantastically and uh, would therefore be available for uh, clinical uh, testing. Now, in summary, I tried to uh, convince you that the innate immune system is actively contributing to neurodegeneration. Um, protein aggregates, including amyloid beta, alpha synuclein, and tau, activate pattern recognition receptors present on innate immune cells. Microglia paraptosis seeds amyloid beta deposition in vitro and in vivo through the release of ast specs. INOS is induced in microglia and astrocytes and produces high amounts of nitric oxide for prolonged period of times. And nitric oxide released in a nitric INOS dependent fashion can post-translationally modify tyrosine and cysteine residues Today, on, uh, uh, for this aggregation uh, issue, I showed you that nitration of a beta at tyrosine 10 seeds a deposition. And with this, I'm at the end. I thank all the people in my uh, previous department, which were involved, our uh, great and fantastic collaborators um, in, uh, at UMass in Tübingen at the University of Barcelona in Paris, Lille, Galveston, in Münster and in Braunschweig and the agencies uh, that fund our work. And uh, as initially said, I am uh, just started in uh, uh, Luxembourg at the wonderful campus in uh, Belleval. And I would uh, um, uh, ask you to uh, write me to this email if you would consider doing a postdoc, a PhD, or even being a technician in one of the most wonderful European countries uh, I ever had the chance to live in. With this, I thank you for your attention and I'll uh, take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Great talk. Um, there are already questions coming up in Q&A folder. You can see that. I, I can read for you and you can answer the questions. The first one is from um, going from top to bottom, uh, Scott Horowitz. Two questions from him. Do AAC specs interact with the nitrate or A-beta? We have not tested this, and I would expect so, but we have not tested that yet. The second question is, does the proteasis network act upon AAC specs or nitrate or A-beta? Um, yeah, that's a good. That's a great question, which we experimentally did not uh, did not, and did not address. What I can uh, say is that uh, um, spec bound or nitrated amyloid beta are much harder to degrade for microglia cells, which have uh, tried to clear it by phagocytosis. So we we run a degradation assays after uh, uptake by immune cells. And so there is some kind of proteostasis if you wish so, um, because they're, they're much harder to, to, to um, digest and degrade. Great. There's a question from anonymous attendee. How do you think does neuroinflammation influence the formation of tau pathology? So we addressed that question in a paper published by uh, my postdoc, Christina Ising, in 2019. And what we showed was that uh, the uh, tau itself is an, a very interesting um, uh, damp, uh, uh, meaning a danger-associated molecular pattern to immune cells. We had tau monomers and tau oligomers being uh, 
stronger induces of a NERP inflammasome activity as compared to uh, tau fibrils. Um, I'll be super interested to uh, dive deeper into it and, and really study which tau uh, fibrils are elicitating uh, which inflammatory reaction and binding to which of the pattern recognition uh, receptors. Um, in turn, we found that um, NAB inflammasome activation and the release of uh, interleukin 1 beta um, uh, by microglia cells would feed back on hypocampal neurons, which would then, in an interleukin 1 receptor dependent, fa uh, uh, dependent fa uh, pathway via CAM kinase to alpha, increase. Uh, increase tau phosphorylation and uh, the formation of paired helical filaments. So there is a yin and yang between inflammation and certainly neuroinflammation is a driver of tau pathology. Great. Um, it's a question from Anup uh, Arnagari. Uh, nice talk. Does the seeding interactions involve disulfide bonds? Very interesting question, which we didn't uh, test for. Um, question from uh, Martin Ingelson. Thanks for the fascinating presentation. In the mouse and the human tissues, you have analyzed what is the percentage of plaques that are formed around the specs? And conversely, how often do you see the mm -hmm. specs that have still not triggered any plaque formation? Okay, that's that's a great question, and uh, actually, I would have loved to to uh, underscore this with more data, but we haven't really finished this work up, and it was not so easy to get to a really high number of, of patient brains. So, uh, we 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 are interacting with uh, different collaborators to answer this question, but. Uh, initially, I would have claimed that 100% of all the plaques we saw have an S positive core, but it's not as high. So uh, a, uh, a plaque is a three-dimensional um, um, uh, structure, and it, it's the question whether we always hit the center um, uh, in the cut we have uh, to stain for. But I would think that on, on plain sight, it's 60 to 70% to of plaques which show an ask uh, immune positive core and around and being released by uh, microglia cells, we see, um, we see uh, um, uh, ask specs which have not yet bound uh, amyloid beta. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are two questions in the chat box. Uh, well, number one from uh, Mihail Aguilator, I think. If the inflammation, in, if the inflammasome is activated and hence CASP1, does A beta has a cleavage site that leads to 1 to 42 A beta? Uh, that's a super interesting question. So I believe not, we didn't have uh, evidence for that. Also, uh, A beta 1 to 42 looks kind of ubiquitin structurally. Do you think there is a ligase making polymers of A beta 1 to 42? Um, we have never tested this and or, or studied this. Um, I would have to, you know, I would have to fantasize. I'm not sure if that has not been tested by others. I do not know of uh, such uh, a system. There's a question from Martin Michel. Did you observe any differential effects on amyloid fibril versus amyloid oligomer formation caused by AAC specs? Uh, it's a, it's in the experiments I showed you. It's a, it's a time question. So it goes through an uh, uh, an oligomer uh, stage and then over time ends up in um, in um, in more uh, fibrils being formed. So the experiments I showed you next to the tyroflavin TSA and the uh, Western blood experiments, especially when we use amyloid beta 1 to 40, this was the case that we found initially an induction of oligomer formation, which later aggregated to, 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 uh, into fibrils if you followed it up over time. There's a question in the Q&A folder from uh, Murgis and Velayudam. Is there any anti-ASC A-beta complex antibodies in the brain? Um, so we, we, we have not observed um, this. What we did is, and this is a cell report paper pub, uh, published uh, in 2020 by uh, my student Lea Frika. What we showed is that 
we have ask a beta complexes and they're even more inflammatory than either ask or a beta alone um, but we haven't seen anti ask a beta antibodies in the brain uh, but we are currently developing them in collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry great uh, that completes all the questions posted in the q and a chat box if you're interested in asking a question you can raise your hand um, you can uh, join the panel. So Marcus, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the, for the very exciting presentation here. So I was wondering, I mean, um, in, I mean, there are other neuroinflammatory conditions in the brain except uh, Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> so, um, I mean, in, in that conditions, have people looked if you then also have kind of a beta associated with uh, a specs? And I mean, could that be a reason for why people which don't have Alzheimer's disease still have a beta deposit sometimes? So, so that's a great question. Um, so what we, um, so I don't know large uh, analysis of human brain tissue. Um, I tell you that we look um, uh, to brain trauma, to uh, open and close the brain trauma, even to mild versus experimentally. And I would love to look then to pathological uh, tissue from brain trauma uh, sufferers um, at one stage to see whether, you know, that um, uh, we all know that brain trauma, uh, even in its mildest form, is a risk factor for uh, later cognitive decline and eventually Alzheimer's disease. So my question would be if you have this kind of initiating moment and aspect release, uh, would that be something that, uh, that, that gets the, the avalanche uh, to go? And, uh, but that's uh, the only uh, experimental paradigm where we look at it and where we hope to be able to look at it um, in, in human tissue as well. Um, we haven't started to look in other neurodegenerative diseases yet um, and in other conditions like uh, stroke or um, or multiple sclerosis. Thank you. And then I would have a second question, if I may, yep. just for personal interest. I mean, you mentioned the TSPO PET imaging, and I'm kind of aware that there are large studies ongoing using TSPO PET imaging in Alzheimer's disease patient cohorts. So, so, so do you know what is sort of the state in terms of how does it develop over the time the TSPO PET signal? When does it kick in, and does it go down then later or up again, or so? And so uh, all I know, I, I know two things because I've been in, involved in the InMind Consortium, which has been uh, uh, funded by the EU for quite some time. So I know that PK11195 is not the, uh, the latest and there are more modern uh, uh, imaging uh, PET markers now, um, like DAB714, uh, for example, which, which is being used. And uh, I, I know that in various neurodegenerative diseases, there, is, there are studies ongoing. Um, what I believe is, is the, the true missing link is the longitudinal uh, analyze. You know, we have a lot of cross-sectional information, um, but we lack the longitudinal uh, assessment where we would start in uh, pre-stages such as, you know, maybe even in healthy control stages or in, in, in SCI, or mm -hmm. early MCI stages, and we lack those studies yet. Okay, so there, there's no time dependent sort of. Okay. There is very few data on, on uh, and and no really longitudinal information. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Danilo. Go ahead. Hey, thank you. I have a question regarding the possible involvement of proteasome function. We know that oxidative stress and nitration are well-known inhibitors of proteasome function. And we know also that a beta peptide is a natural substrate of proteasome. Have you ever tried to monitor proteasome function uh, simultaneously, concomitantly with uh, a beta uh, oligomer formation? No, we did not. The only uh, we, we we had thoughts into that direction um, uh, until the postdoc who was running that part of the project has left uh, uh, to pharmaceutical industry. What we did is, in terms of 
you know, not directly related to the proteasome, but to protein degradation, we looked at uh, effects on IDE. And interestingly, uh, IDE can be uh, nitrated as well it, um, itself, and its, uh, uh, its degrading function for amyloid beta is decreased uh, uh, through that. That's a, a paper published uh, by Markus Kummer in my lab. Um, so there are known effects and impairments of protein degradation. And uh, I think it's, it would be super interesting to study this in greater details uh, and with a focus on the proteasome. Thank you. Oh, Michael, there's a question in the chat uh, box. Um, I'll read it for you from Camilo La Rosa. Nice talk. Patients with cognitive impairment do not show fibrillar deposits. Whereas patients without cognitive impairment show fibrillar deposits. Your hypothesis is based on the amyloid hypothesis. You have considered the role of oxidized. Did you consider the role of oxidized lipids found in the extracellular space in A beta toxicity? Uh, no, we have not looked at this in this system. Okay, that completes all the questions. Um, any other questions from the panel? Marcus, Danilo, great talk. Great talk, uh, Michael. So I maybe maybe I ask one right. more. Maybe maybe ahead, yeah, ask yeah. one more. I mean, of course, you're collaborating with Jochen Walter, right? And uh, and I mean, he spent a lot of time on phosphorylation of APDA. Mm -hmm. So, so can you give us your personal opinion on nitration versus phosphorylation? <laughs> We, we have, you know, this is this is interesting because I, I, I just um, I believe that um, of course, and you know that I, I'm, we, I did parts of these in vivo uh, studies and and um, I'm co-authoring these papers, and I believe that phosphorylation has its own role. I need that. I believe that there's a, a magnitude of of undiscovered. Uh, um, undiscovered post-translational modifications, which might be really, really important, which we will step-by-step step, uh, um, uh, uh, identify. And I uh, would be interesting to see, you know, what comes first, what, what is second, what initiates inflammation, what drives INOS, which then leads to, you know, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm completely making this up, maybe phosphorylated uh, amyloid beta is a fantastic immunogen, which induces innate immune uh, reactivity, then driving INOS expression, which then by nitric oxide uh, dependent nitric oxide release modifies again amyloid beta um, uh, and and together with the uh, with the uh, ask specs being released this is a fantastic seed for for further deposition and so we I'm, I'm trying to understand how this uh, works in a longitudinal uh, 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 scale, because mm, uh, you know it, it will. There will be uh, changes along this decade-lasting uh, trajectory of disease pathogenesis, and I think we just have to um, identify which um, of these modifications occurs at which time, and and may influence the uh, disease progression uh, in in which way. And I cannot tell you whether phosphorylation comes first or after, or if it's a, a parallel uh, a phenomenon. But certainly, er, er, regardless from which perspective we take, I think all these protein modifications massively influence the propensity to aggregate and, and thereby uh, and can be found in the diseased brains, not only in the rodent models. Um, and that tells me that uh, it's it's they likely have a, a disease uh, propelling role. Thank you. There is a question in the chat box. Michael uh, Agleta, this is the first time I see the sequence of ABDA one to forty two. You have a perfect ER targeting sequence right in the middle. Have you seen one to forty two going through? going to the ER, could you prevent aggregation if inhibiting, uh, I think by inhibiting this step? Oh, this is, you know, this, uh, there, are, there are better people to ask this. And I know that uh, Jochen Walter was just mentioned, studied these trafficking mechanisms for ages. Uh, and uh, another expert is uh, certainly Christian Haas in, in, in Munich. 
Uh, we have not studied uh, uh, trafficking within the different cellular uh, compartments yet, but we would do the, uh, we would certainly do this and then study whether or not inflammatory signaling uh, influences uh, such such trafficking. But we're not there yet, and there are uh, a lot of unanswered questions out there. But thank you for 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 the uh, the idea. I wasn't aware of that sequence. So, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, I think we are done with the questions um, from the audience and the panel. Thanks for a great presentation. So, thanks for joining Thank you us. for having me. Uh, uh, goodbye. Uh, hope to see you sooner or later again and in person meetings. Absolutely. Thank you thanks, again. Marcus. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.